The goal of my research is to understand how the brain produces behavior. And the work described in my essay specifically asks where our sense of thirst comes from and then how the brain uses that information to control drinking behavior. Traditionally, thirst was thought to arise exclusively from dedicated cells in the brain that sense when we're dehydrated. This is an intuitive model because it explains how we can match our needs to our behavior, but it has a crucial shortcoming, which is that drinking behavior is regulated on a really fast moment by moment basis that can't be explained by these slowly evolving changes in dehydration signals in the blood. So we sought to address this by recording the activity of these thirst neurons located deep in the brain for the first time in awake behaving mice. And what this showed is that these neurons do, as historical models suggested, encode an animal state of dehydration, um, but they also receive a second faster class of signals that arise from the mouth and throat and gut during eating and drinking. And instead of reporting an animal's current hydration status, these signals predict changes in hydration that will occur many minutes in the future as a result of eating and drinking. And this allows these cells to adjust our sense of thirst preemptively. And this is an exciting finding because it allows us for the first time to explain aspects of everyday human behavior, like how thirst is quenched rapidly when we drink water, how eating stimulates thirst, and how oral cooling or drinking cold liquids can be experienced as especially thirst quenching. My research uh, has been focused on looking at the communication between brain regions and how they're important for regulating our ability and desire to obtain rewards. And so rewards are something that we're very familiar with. They're these attractive things that we're motivated to obtain. And evolutionarily, they're really important for um, promoting fitness and survival. And this, the ability to obtain these rewards requires a number of factors to come together. For instance, um, locating that reward or having the motivation to even obtain that reward. And we were really interested in the neuronal circuit mechanisms that regulate that process. And we focused on input from the hippocampus, the nucleus accumbens, because the, that input is important for providing that contextual information that allows organisms to locate rewards, and it's also important in regulating the activity of the nucleus accumbens, which we know from a lot of work is a really important modulator of reward behaviors and dysfunction we see um, uh, frequently with diseases associated with reward like addiction and depression. And what we found was that there is this bi-directional relationship between the strength of the communication between the hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens and reward behavior. And so when we see increases in strength, we see reward that promotes reward uh, related behaviors. And when we weaken that communication, that causes disruption or deficits in reward behaviors like anhedonia or this loss of pleasure derived from pre previously pleasurable activities that you see in depression. And so our work really establishes the communication between the hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens as a critical modulator of reward behavior. My research focuses on uh, the neuronal circuits of the visual system and in particular of the cerebral cortex, which is evolutionarily speaking, the most recent part of our brain. So the visual cortex, uh, the portion of the cerebral cortex that processes visual information, is one of the most carefully characterized parts of the brain. And uh, according to the standard models, visual information reaches the cerebral cortex in uh, the so-called primary visual cortex, also called V1. So V1 is called primary visual cortex because uh, gets inputs directly from the periphery. And then V1 projects to higher visual areas, uh, which our cortical region defines as higher because uh, the responses are believed to depend on V1 activity. So in contrast with this uh, hierarchical model, I discovered that uh, one of the so-called higher visual areas uh, does not rely at all on V1. And so this area is called postrinal cortex or POR. And uh, I found that uh, uh, after silencing V1, the visual responses of POR were still intact. So if not from V1, then uh, um, how does POR get uh, visual input? 
and uh, we discovered that uh, POR receives visual information from an evolutionarily ancient midbrain structure called superior colliculus. So the superior colliculus is uh, the, the main visual processor of many vertebrates, uh, like birds, fish and reptiles. And, uh, and this discovery, in a sense, breaks a, a long-standing dogma showing the existence of a novel primary visual cortex, which is independent of the one and uh, dedicated to the superior colliculus, this ancient visual center. So my study uh, defines a new cortical entry point uh, of visual information. I'm motivated in my research by the moments of discovery that we really only have the ability to experience for the first time these days. Um, so I have the privilege of using tools for studying neurons that were only invented in the last few years. And these allow us to go into the brain and manipulate and monitor neurons that have really fundamental roles in our behavior that neuroscientists have never been able to study before. And it's exciting to be able to do these experiments because there are moments where in an instant you can answer a question that's puzzled physiologists or neuroscientists for decades, um, but it was never accessible until now. And those moments of discovery are really, really exciting. What I enjoy about the day-to-day -day work in my lab is getting to ask new questions and discover new things. And now as a PI, getting to share that excitement and that um, excitement and sense of discovery with my trainees. Um, it's very rewarding to take a student from just learning a new technique for the first time to that excitement of that first piece of data. I decided to submit an entry for the prize because when I read the essays from past winners, I found it really inspiring how they distilled all of this research they had done into a simple, compelling narrative that had a really interesting plot and told a story about their work. And I wanted to convey my own research in the same way. I was extremely happy when I realized that my work was recognized through the Eppendorf and Science Prize. Um, in this job, you are surrounded by very smart and knowledgeable people who work really hard. And if, on the one hand, this is a positive source of inspiration. On the other hand, you constantly ask yourself if you're good enough. Now, if you're an introspective person, you start questioning your abilities and you end up being your worst enemy. So having my work recognized through this prize feels great. It means that other scientists are interested in what I'm doing and uh, I'm asking the right questions. As a mom and a assistant professor, I try to balance my life by trying to be as organized as I possibly can and scheduling things and trying to be super efficient. It's a work in progress, I must say, and I'm still learning new tips and tricks that I'm trying to apply. Um, but my kids are awesome and I really like spending time with them so I want to make sure that I make all of the time that I can to spend with them. And it's not something that I do alone. Um, I have a great co-parenting system and my husband is really awesome and he's sort of the keystone that keeps everything together and keeps me from going crazy. <laughs> my advice to anyone thinking about submitting an essay for the prize is to just do it because it's a really useful exercise in distilling all of this research that we do that can often be highly specialized into a form that's compelling to a general audience or a broader audience. And that's what makes a lot of the best science writing compelling. And for me, the exercise of going through that process was really useful in thinking about how to frame my work for grants and in papers as well. My advice to other researchers thinking of entering next year is just try, you never know. So the amazing thing about this prize is that it's not based on a nomination of some outstanding stars from the Hall of Fame of Neuroscience, but it's purely based on the essay written by the applicant. So if you have a good story and uh, if you are able to convey the enthusiasm for your science, try it because you really have a shot at it.